Let's work. Let's work. Come on. Let's work. Let's work. Come on. Let's work. Let's work. Come on. You can wish for it or you can work for it. You gotta work for greatness. If you ain't working, you should be working. Come on. Let's work. These are the Confessions of a Workaholic. Welcome to Confessions of a Workaholic, where we share the success secrets of fearless female entrepreneurs who are obsessed with success. This is your girl, Coriel. So excited to have you back for another week to get up close and personal with another boss. This episode is brought to you by Work Pray Slay Weekend, which returns to ATL October 31st through November 3rd. For details on how you can attend the biggest and best women's weekend of the year, be sure to log on to workprayslay.com. So today we are talking to the serial techpreneur and workaholic Dawn Dixon herself. As a serial entrepreneur with over 16 years of experience in marketing and business development, Dawn launched four successful cash flow positive companies since 2002. Her most recent ventures include Flat Out of Heels, which are the rollable flats that all of y'all have seen. Um, These rollable flats were for women to get relief from painful heels. And Popcom, after identifying a need to make vending machines more intelligent. Dawn has received numerous awards and accolades for her business savvy and pitching skills and has been invited to speak on numerous panels and workshops, as well as being featured in countless media outlets, including Forbes, Black Enterprise, Fortune, Huffington Post, Essence Magazine, CNBC, Yahoo, and many more. Dawn, are you ready to confess? Yes, let's let's get it. Let's get to it. You know, you read my bio, it'll make me sound so good, but you are all that and more. Listen, behind the bio. <laughs> <laughs> this the boss behind the bio. Yes. This um is long overdue, but I'm so glad that you know everything happens in perfect timing because now you have so much more to talk about, so many more exciting things um that you are working on and rolling out. So super excited to get into your business today. But to take it back, when we first met, um, you were like in the trenches with flat out of heels. And so I know that now you're going in a different direction, but I want to ask, was it pivot? Was it difficult for you to pivot? Um, and you can give like a little background on flat out of heels and kind of what your transition was, but specifically, what was that pivot point like for you? Yeah, definitely. So actually, there wasn't a pivot. They're two totally separate companies and flat out is still live and well and kicking. So um, flat out of heels, they're rollable ballet flats for when your feet hurt from, um, you know, wearing heels for hours. And I guess, you know, there was a slight pivot because I changed the business from B to C, which is business to customer where we were selling shoes online, um, and taking orders and, you know, trying to doing web marketing and, you know, doing that whole e-commerce business. And now we are just B to B. So business to business. And we sell thousands at a time to stores like DSW, um, we sell to Google, we sell to ADP, AEP, AARP, and Facebook. So we've done business with businesses and we sell flat outs mainly as swag um, for conferences and events. And then now um, DSW will be our exclusive online distributor. So we don't like do one-off orders. So that that freed me up from worrying about managing a day-to-day e-commerce operation, shipping, fulfillment, customer service, and all those things, and just do big orders. And when I changed to that, of course, the revenue model changed and we get, I mean, the margins are higher when you manufacture something for a low price and sell one, you know, sell it for more. But when you think about selling thousands as opposed to one or two pairs at a time, it just made more sense to do it that way. So flat out is definitely a cash flow business that I don't see going anywhere anytime soon is actually accelerating now, but we're kind of quiet because we're not selling direct to customer. So you know, you could catch, get some flat outs at an event or a conference. The last one we were at the Black Enterprise Women of Power event. Um, so things like that. But the initial idea for flat out from the beginning was to sell flat outs and vending machines. And we did do that. We had our first vending machine in Atlanta Airport, Club Live in Miami, MGM Grand, Casino in uh, Las Vegas. But that's when I realized that compared to my e-commerce store, you know, with all the information I can get about 
who the customers are, where they're shopping from, my conversion rates. I can remarket the customer, send them an email, sell them other products through retargeting. None of that could happen in the physical brick and mortar setting of vending. So I really identified another problem. And you know, as an entrepreneur, that's what we do. We solve problems. We see a problem, especially if we experience it, and then try to come up with a solution. So my problem of really scaling my flat out vending machines, scaling meaning having multiple locations and growing it across the country like I planned, was the lack of data. And so I set out in 2016 to solve that challenge of how can we allow vending machines and digital ordering kiosks to collect more customer data. And that's through software. So I've already had the business Popcom since 2012. I started flat out 2011 in Popcom, which is called Solutions Vending International in 2012. So it wasn't really a pivot from what I was doing, but a pivot from the way we were doing it. So from B2B, I mean, B2C to B2B, and now from hardware to software and hardware. So now I'm building software too. So let me ask you this. Well, first of all, thanks for clearing that up. Flat Out is alive and well. We just ain't seeing it because she's getting them big checks. She's not worried about these little coins. Okay, (laughs) that's that. But I find myself, um, or I have found, because I'm working through it, so we're going to use past tense. I have found myself being stubborn um, in business when I plan something, I map it out, I expect it to go this way. I want it to be successful in this way that, you know, it was in my head. And, you know, when you originally started Flat Out of Heels, you saw it as this vending machine. Then you saw it as, you know, e-commerce. And now you've been able to transition and, you know, equally as successful and maybe even more successful. But did you ever find yourself feeling stubborn or wanting to just force it to work the way you wanted it to work? And how did you get over that if you if you did go through that? Like, how did you take your personal feelings um, out of it and really just focus on, like, I got to figure out what's best for business? Yeah. So, like, I always have had the mindset, now I'm in my 18th year of entrepreneurship, and I worked as a consultant for six years with a lot of different products and launches. So I knew before I started flat out, that nine times out of 10, things just don't go how you, how, you, how you plan it. But it's good to have a plan, but shit don't go that, that, as planned most of the time. So, you know, my thing is always figuring out what is going to work. And as soon as I realize it's going to work, I just make that move. I don't dwell on it. I don't, you know, of course I get disappointed. Like, man, I thought this e-commerce thing was going to blow up. I'm doing all the growth hacking. I'm doing all the influencers, but it's not going as planned. But hey, these corporations want to place orders. Let's just move to that. So it never was you know, me being stuck because as a business owner, when you need cash flow, you can't get stuck because then you don't make no money. You have to keep moving towards what's paying. So when I realize something's not working, I make a very fast adjustment. And I've been this way for all of my career, um, not getting stuck where I can't see past things because if I would have, I'd be out of business now. My first idea was selling in vending machines. I never wanted an e-commerce store. When the vending machines, I couldn't find anybody to build them. This is before I built my own. And I was like, man, I got 3,000 pairs of shoes and no vending machine. I better open an online store. I didn't want to, but that's what was going to sell the shoes. So I just do what it's going to take. And even when I I tell my team, like, listen, we just need to do what's going to work. I'm willing to do what's in the best interest of the business and put whatever I feel to the side. Because a lot of times we have ideas in our mind, even about what our customers want, and it's what we think they want. And when they say, no, nah, I really want something different, we have, to, we have to adapt quick and make that change immediately to stay alive. And that's how we've been able to still be here now seven years later. So being that you have a team and even outside of like the team that works for you and with you, there are people in your circle, in your community, your business besties, your accountability partners, just people in your network um, that influence us, whether they know it or realize it or mean to or whatever, did you have to deal with like the doubts or the opinions of any of those people whose opinions you actually value? Like it's easy to brush people off when we don't really care, when we don't really value, you know, what they say, but did you have to deal with the doubts or the opinions of other people when you decided to shift your focus? Um, really, I didn't experience that from like my team or my friends or my accountability, but I did get it from my investors. And when my investors really stopped believing in me and supporting me, that was hard because it's like, well, you gave me your money and now you don't believe in me anymore. 
to the point where they won't give, you know, they wouldn't give me any more money to keep going. And they just were like, I'm ready to count my losses. Like, you know, I'm not feeling how you're doing things. And, you know, investors, that's what they do. It's a numbers game. You invest in things, everything don't hit and they're willing to take losses. And it was hard for me to realize like, man, like they really count me as a loss. Like they're really walking away. Like they don't believe in it. So it never was my people, but it, it, it was hard when I said, realized I was like out here on my own. And that really is relates to Popcom. My flat out investors are friends and family. I only have one venture capital investor, which is Backstage Capital for flat out. So my friends and family always believe, but for Popcom, it's a software company. We raised almost a million dollars to date for that business. And that came from, you know, venture capital and angel investors. And that it was hard when they were like, "Mm, you know, this isn't moving as fast as we think it is, or we don't really like the direction, or we're not really feeling cannabis, or we're not really feeling tokenization or, you know, ICOs and STOs. So we're just not dealing with you no more. That, that was hard. And I think that no matter who it comes from, I feel like that's just part of it. Like somebody is going to have something to say. um, And, and that, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think when we're going through it, we sometimes feel like, um, or we don't know how to deal with it. And we, you know, sometimes start to look at ourselves, like we're doing something wrong because other people, um, feel that way or, or, you know, think that we're doing something wrong, but this is part of the journey. Everybody's not always going to feel it. Everybody's not always going to understand it or be able to see the vision. Um, but that does not mean that you can't be successful and you don't really have time to slow down and stop and explain the things, um, that are a part of your vision. And, you know, now that you're a million dollars later, um, you know that you um, were following your calling or, you know, doing the right thing. So definitely congratulations on that. Um, no easy feat. What would you say has been your biggest asset in fundraising? Um, I'm thinking it's relationships, but what would you say has been the most beneficial when it comes to fundraising? You were spot on, really. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you know this, and it is about relationships. Um, getting, you know, having the network of the right people that have the checks that they can write and, um, you know, getting into the right rooms and in front of the decision makers and making it through those many layers and layers. But even beyond relationships, it's like tenacity, like, you know, not giving up, being able to take no for an answer or because for me, I always say no means not right now. So actually, almost everybody that invested in me told me no at one point. But I just didn't settle for no. I just came back and circled back and followed up every three months and followed up and followed up until they were like, okay, either I wore them down or they were like, she really onto something. So, you know, just never giving up is the thing. I mean, it's hard in the beginning when you don't have your proof of concept out or you don't have your business launched, but you know it's a good business. And even though you may have validated it and you have customers who want it, investors want to see revenue. They want to see commitments. They want to see a product. So to get them to invest before you have those things is, is really difficult. But, you know, once things start moving, it's just important to like just keep going without them, like bootstrap, as they say, or, you know, just never, never take no for an answer. But the network does help. But you have to put yourself in the rooms. Nobody just said, oh, you know, Dawn should be here. I like just put myself there. I just showed up. And I kept showing up to the point where they realized, like, okay, I see her all the time, so she must supposed to be here. But it wasn't ever where someone was like, oh, you, you deserve a million dollars. Like, you ha- I had to know what I was worth. I had to know what my business was worth and just be relentless when it came to, um, you know, getting what I needed to grow it. So would you say that that comes natural for you and... What advice can you offer to the woman listening who knows what she has, knows what she's capable of, but just cannot seem to muster up that confidence to put herself in the room? What can she do to like hype herself up to be able to do that confidently? I mean, that's a hard one for me because your first question was like, was I born like Emma? Was I born like this? And I've literally always been like this. Even as a little kid with my first dance recital, I was two years old coming back out on stage doing a dance on my own. Like it really, confidence is like who I am. I've always felt that way. A lot of to do with the way I was raised and that my mother instilled it in me, confidence in me all the time and just boosted me up. But for people who don't have that confidence, I mean, I'm going to think of what 
advice could I give to someone that doesn't believe in themselves? It's like, you know, the, the, the Lauren Hill, how you going to win if you're not right within? Like, you got to dig deep within yourself and figure out what is, what are you doubting? Where that self-doubt come from? And it may be connected to something that you don't realize. It could be something, some trauma, it could be some childhood issues, but like fixing your issues is the core foundation to success in, in any area, whether it be business, whether it be relationships with your spouse or significant other, like figuring out what is your block and, and, and healing that. You know, what, what's keeping you from feeling confident? And then really t- doing the work on you. Therapy, ladies. Let it be your friend. Um, what about just being a Black woman in tech, though? Like, I know that it's, well, I don't know because I'm not in the industry. But from the outside looking in, it looks like it might be a little lonely in the space. How do you um, deal with those specific challenges if there are any? I mean, definitely. So my first business was a tech company in 2001. So I've been working in the space for a really long time and I never seen anybody that looked like me. Now there's a lot more black women in the tech space. I mean, it's not a huge amount, but I don't feel lonely. We have a great network and they're very supportive, but the overall um, ecosystem is still not built for us. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley, venture capital investing, that was started in the 60s, 70s around IBM and Microsoft and these businesses, and it was white male dominated. There wasn't even any black people out there in general. So now over the past, I mean, even eight years, because even in 2011, there was a um, special on MSNBC by Soledad O'Brien about, you know, blacks in Silicon Valley. And there wasn't any in 2011. So this is, this is recently. So it's been like an influx of that. So it's, it's, I love to see all the black people, the women getting into tech, getting into the space. But just because we're getting into it doesn't mean we're going to get the support from the overall ecosystem. So the hard part is what's called pattern matching, which is it's data, it's numbers. They take the data from successful founders, founders who have scaled, grew businesses to the millions, exited. And those are the people that they want to put their money into. Well, historically, those have been white men. Because that's only people that had a chance. So even to this day, we're fighting to create a new pattern, which is only going to be done with this new wave of black female founders that are just getting funded for the first time. You know, if you've seen the statistics, the average amount of money that a black woman raises is $43,000. $43,000. But the average seed round for tech startups is $1.5 million. But we're at $43,000. So, you know, the fact that there's maybe now, now, let's say I'm going to be like generous, maybe be 45 black women who've raised over a million dollars, which I'm included in that. We have to shift the narrative and create a new pattern. So the challenge is showing people that we can do something that's never been demonstrated in history from people that look like us. Well, you have your work cut out for you, but it looks like you are well on your way. And I'm glad that there is um, a a network developing um, because relationships are so important. And I definitely think that once you have overcome certain challenges, it's literally like your duty to, you know, help someone else um, overcome those challenges as well. What advice can you offer to the women listening who may just be getting started in business and don't really know how to create or nurture relationships that could potentially turn into um, partnerships? I mean, the first thing is have, being super tight, like having your stuff together, knowing your business inside and out, or even if it's not an actual business yet, doing the work and the research to package it in a way where it shows, you know, the market, you know, the, you know, what's going to take to grow that you understand your revenue potential, your business model, you like have your stuff on point. So when you do approach somebody, they're like, okay, she knows what she's talking about. A lot of times we, as in black women, make the mistake of, just thinking you have an idea and that's good enough. Or, you know, I've seen so many pitch competitions where, I mean, women just, we just, they just aren't, don't have their shit together. They don't know their numbers. They don't understand term sheets and valuations. They want to go get an investor, but don't understand anything about venture capital or investing at all. So my thing is the first step is have your shit tight. Then go into a room and be equipped 
to really network with purpose and not, you know, people want to take you serious. And a lot of times it's like, they don't take us serious because we're not taking ourselves serious. We're not doing the work. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to this, Coriel, because you deal with a lot of entrepreneurs in your business and coaching and things, but it's like the foundation that you need to have. You haven't even done that, but you want somebody to help you. You have to do the work. It's not easy. Nothing is easy. It's never going to be handed to you. It's never going to be easy. Do the work. Once you do the work, I, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm definitely an example of that. It's in, it's in the other black women that have had success raising money and growing businesses and even bootstrapping businesses without raising money because you don't need to raise money to have a successful business. But you do need to have your shit together. So you need to have your that's shit. the bottom line. <laughs> that's <laughs> the bottom line. So it's, it, you know, it, I've, I've done a lot to try to be the change I want to see. Like, you know, and I put out content and my blog and um, my podcast called Bars to really educate entrepreneurs. My podcast is basically a step-by-step on how to start a business and how, like from start to finish, from getting the idea set up to getting it, figuring out the legal entity to getting customers to raise the money to uh, all of that. And that was something that I just gave to the public because, you know, I want to see us progress and move forward. I want the black women to come in the room. We're already starting businesses at a larger rate than any other demographic in the country, but I want us to come in there shining and have our stuff on point. You made so many good points Um, because I do see people all the time who want the help, but they have not helped themselves. And I think that is where it all starts. People are willing to help you. I think, you know, most people are willing to help you once they can see that you've helped yourself. And like you said, you have something worth helping and worth, worth investing their time into it. But if you haven't even invested your own time into it, I don't know how you expect somebody else. People ask me questions that are on Google. Like, why would you waste your time that you have with me that I'm basically I'm an expert for some things on, on Google? You need to ask me something that you can't find the answer to, that you've searched high and low and you coming to me for that. Exhaust all resources. Read every book possible. Listen to every podcast possible. Then go out and ask for help. Yeah, don't make yourself look silly. Don't do it. Bottom line. Um, So, okay, self-care. Got to talk about the importance of self-care because as a successful entrepreneur, running, managing multiple businesses, multiple people, um, you are a mother. So you you are being pulled in several different directions. How important is self-care in relation to your success? And do you have any um, self-care ritual or routine or or anything that you do on on a consistent basis that kind of helps you to refocus and recharge? Yes, 100%. I would definitely say self-care is the number one priority for me and always, you know, has been not always my whole career, but at least over the past five years, it's been a priority because I realized that if I wasn't good, I can't be good at anything else for anybody else. I can't be a good mother. I can't be a good CEO. I can't be a good friend. I can't be a good anything if I'm not good within myself. I have an entire podcast episode dedicated to self-care and talking about the different things that I do. But really, self-care is really what makes you feel good. So like my version of self-care could unplug from the phone. I take vacations and things and I love to travel and I take about three or four vacations a year. But, you know, even if I couldn't afford to go on a trip, it's like I unplug, turn the phone off. I read a book. I read it for an hour a night. Listen to a podcast. Take a bath. You know, take the time and cook dinner with my daughter. Go work out, you know meditate. I have just bought something called a Muse, M-U-S-E, a Muse headband, where it really helps you to learn how to exercise meditation and focus. So I like, I've really been into strengthening my meditation practice, which helps me to quiet my mind, which really helps with the things that come into your head, like the negative voices, the self-doubt, the drama that you create for yourself. If you can learn how to quiet that and control your own mind. So really like having that self-control is what I've been focusing on now that I'm 40. You know, I want to I'm in a new era of life. So really learning how to like just be peaceful no matter what. So like self-care is anything that makes me feel good for the moment. Sometimes I'll just, you know, pull up, pull up to the house and be in the garage and sit there for 10 minutes in the garage in the car and just chill for a minute. Like whatever you need to do to give yourself something that replenishes you and fills you back up, whatever it is for you. 
40 and fine. First of all, y'all got to go check her out. See the face behind the voice because y'all are not going to believe that she is 40. But you heard it here first. Um, Okay, so you mentioned traveling. Um, That's one thing that I know that you love. For the women who don't see the value in getting out and seeing the world, what can you say is like one thing that travel has taught you? Definitely gratitude and worldview. I mean, you could think your situation is so effed up and then you go and see someone that doesn't have electricity or running water and they're smiling and they're happy. And you're like, I'm like, you know what? Okay, are we, we're, at, we're at a runway right now. Or, you know, my product's not ready in the time I want it to be. Or some other smaller things. My man ain't acting right. But then it's like, my issues aren't that great because no matter what, I'm still in the top 1% of people in the world, as far as like, if you make over $30,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of people in the world. I mean, we got to keep that in the perspective. Like we take for granted that me and you could even talk on this, on this call right now that we have telephones or now this is, you know, digital, we have the internet. There's so many people that don't have this. And, and I travel places so I can keep things in a perspective about culture and about what do I really need? Do I need all these things that Instagram tells me I need? Like, what do I really need and like how to be grateful? And that's, that definitely is one of the main things. Definitely, definitely true. It is a whole nother world out there. And if we are just relying on the gram or the movies and the media to paint a picture of what's going on outside of these uh, borders, you are definitely um, going to be shocked, surprised, and hopefully filled with gratitude uh, when you see what the rest of the world is working with. Okay, so Dawn, I cannot let you go without asking you about some game-changing books. I know that it is always too tough to choose just one. So what would you say are two or three books that all of my listeners need to add to their reading list? Definitely the four agreements. And that's the foundation of like just my thought process. And if they're interested in getting investor money and growing a business, I would read venture deals to have an understanding of the way that capital works in an investment and startup and business environment. So venture deals and the four agreements. And then my go-to other favorite, you know, is the Vortex. It's by Esther and Jerry Hicks. And, you know, even though two of these are not business books, again, it goes back with self-care. If you're not right in your mind, you can't be right anywhere else. So the Vortex just helps you to manage relationships. And it's a different and very clear way of like dealing with people and staying in your Vortex. And it's the Vortex of what it's called the Vortex of Well-Being. And not letting anyone penetrate your your positivity and your in the energy that you have. So I highly recommend listening to the Vortex as an audio book, and then reading um, the Four Agreements. And just um, it changed my life when I was twenty seven. So check those out. I have read the Four Agreements and the Vortex. I haven't read the other. I need I need some capital, so we need to get that popping as well. Um, But I have truly enjoyed this conversation and I know that all of my listeners appreciate all of these gems that you have been dropping. Please let them know where they can find you online and how they can connect with you on social media. And I know that you are still doing fundraising. So if we are able to get in on that, let them know how they can do that too. Yes, thank you. We are fundraising. Um, We're raising right now $943,000 in a public sale. So that means anybody can invest in my tech company. We've raised a little bit over, we raised about $975,000 already. And so we're looking to raise more. And the minimum investment is $252, which is groundbreaking. I mean, I talk about this on my blog. So I want you to just, I'll direct you to my blog, which is um, medium at Dawn Dixon. Then you can find me on LinkedIn at Dawn Dixon, Instagram, Dawn W. Dixon, and that's spelled D-I-C-K-S-O-N. And I talk about, you know, this new way I'm raising money, how I'm helping to create wealth and allow people to invest in early stage tech companies, which never in the history of America have people been able to invest in an early stage with big VCs until now. So I really wanted to help to bring um, wealth to our community in that way. And that website is startengine.com forward slash popcom. But if you go to me, if you go to any of my social media, I'm talking about it all day. And, you know, I hope that um, people take time to learn about how you can invest in startups. 
This has been another game-changing episode of Confessions of a Workaholic, meant to empower and encourage you to get that ass to work. You already have everything you need to get everything you want if you are willing to do the work. I love you. See you next week.